Since you're talking about acceleration of uh, and, and the use of uh, data and what that could mean as far as uh, development is concerned, uh, you know, from a gov from providing government services, I mean, you know, Aadhaar, of course, today we heard Kenneth Rogov was critical of demonetization, but he said the world has plenty to learn as far as the Aadhaar uh, execution is concerned. From an Aadhaar perspective now and the way that the government is using biometric information to ensure that leakages are cut down when it comes to providing uh, subsidies or empowering citizens, what what can it now do? What is the next step? What's the next phase in terms of the engagement that the government can can have with citizens' bases? This well, I think uh, obviously one big thing, which is still probably just halfway there, is the subsidy reforms. And now more and more government schemes and entitlements are using the Aadhaar EBT. Today, the Aadhaar system has 500 million, or 50 crore, bank accounts linked to Aadhaar, which can be used for DBT. And already the government has done more than two billion transactions, totaling up about nine or ten cro nine or ten billion dollars worth of money. So it's the world's largest cash transfer program. So that will continue. The other big thing is using eKYC to get a SIM card or open a bank account. Today the Aadhaar system does on June 30th they did 40 million of four crore authentications. A large part of that was eKYC. Mm. So eKYC is making India paperless. So when you use Aadhaar eKYC to open a bank account or get a SIM card or buy an insurance policy, it's all electronic. That's the huge thing. So to make India paperless, eKYC is the next big thing which will happen. Hmm. Then, of course, you have the whole cashless thing thanks to UPI. So I think over the next few years, the digitization of India through paperless and cashless transactions is where the activity will go towards. Uh, you know, we were just talking about the role that regulators will play. Uh, and w while, you know, the privacy matter is currently being heard in the Supreme Court, so I won't get you to comment uh, necessarily on that. But on the issue of, and, and you address this uh, challenge of creating monopolies uh, because you've been able to aggregate large amounts of data, uh, what kind of a regulatory challenge will that throw up for the TRAI, for instance? No, I think... Uh well, I don't know about any specific regulator, but generally his, it's actually has to do with competition and innovation. And historically, competition and innovation law has been driven by things like consumer prices and uh, uh, consumer welfare and prices. Now, in this new world of data, you actually give things away free and get data. So it doesn't fulfill the classical definition of uh, competition. So we need a whole new thinking on how do we apply competitive uh, law to data monopolies the, and that work is still around the world it's still very new uh, you know when we we talk about the challenges that india is facing and and specifically since uh, since you know how the indian it industry uh, has worked over the past three decades or so uh, given the fact that we're moving towards this sort of data aid so to speak what kind of challenges does this throw up for the indian it sector in specific well well no i think I think partly, obviously, the businesses that use data are becoming stronger and stronger. So that's one thing that they need to look at. But also, I think uh, the use of AI and machine learning on data is increasing automation. So a lot of functions that were done earlier are not being done today. Mm. A lot of things that are done by people are done by machines. Mm. So there's a change in the market. The, the third change in the market is that the, the, the balance of power is shifting from businesses that sold to enterprises to businesses that sold to consumers. So yeah. all the big leaders today are B2C companies. So I think uh, you know the, the ability of companies to understand these mega trends mm. and then have a strategy where they continue to be relevant and effective, mm. that's the heart of the issue. In this digital uh, age, in this data-driven age then, what does that mean when it comes to job creation? And what is it that the government or the corporate sector, in fact, should be looking at in terms of priorities uh, to ensure that we are able to fulfill that aspiration? Then again, I think inverting the data is very, 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 very much required because today in GST, there'll be 8 billion businesses, upward of 20 lakhs of revenue who will all be there. And for the first time, they will have a very detailed digital footprint of their invoices because they have to supply that for getting credit. And therefore, they can then take their own invoices, mm. again, it's their own data, and go to a bank and say, give me a loan. So suddenly, businesses that were not getting loans from uh, uh, the banking system will start getting loans. So just the sheer democratization of credit mm. with data will mean millions of new businesses will get credit, 
which in turn means that they will grow, which in turn means they will create jobs. So I think the way to think about job creation is not to see how many large companies create jobs, but how do you make millions of small companies add one or two jobs each. Mm. That itself will be a huge thing. What worries you uh, about this data-driven age that we're in? First of all, I think it's happening at an astonishingly fast pace. And Has it even surprised you? Yeah, I think last one or two years I'm just uh, you know bewildered by the pace of change. Mm. Not me, everybody is bewildered. And I think uh, it's a very important policy issue. It's not a technology, it's not about some technologies figuring out. Mm. It's as a country, as a nation that is trying to ensure uh, growth, progress, jobs, incomes. How does data fit into our strategy has to be thought through mm. at a very high level in a very thoughtful manner mm. for the future. So what is it that you would like the government to to, and how would you like the government to think about this? Well, I think there are three or four things. One is government databases themselves must allow users to get access to their own data. So I should be able to get my income tax data, my GSTN data, my driver's data, mm. whatever. Then regulators must do that in their respective provinces. So RBI has to do it in banking, SEBI in markets and so on. And third, for all other players, the government should pass a modern data protection and empowerment law, which basically puts the user at the center of his own data. Hmm. And the fourth thing is, now with all these massive national systems, we can now look at data as a way of driving the real-time economy. Hmm. Because we have real-time data on exactly what's happening where, in which business, at a scale that unprecedented. Hmm. So I'd start using that data to manage the economy. You know, when you talk about, uh, and you you spoke extensively about how, uh, you know, Facebook and Google and, you know, how they've emerged today as, as the most valuable companies uh, uh, that we look at. But through Fundamentum, for instance, the new fund that you've you've launched, is this, are data-driven companies going to be a, a focus area, a priority area for you? Not particularly. I mean, no? we, we think that there are lots and lots of areas in India which require automation. Aggregation, for example, uh, aggregating informal markets, you know, getting, for example, I have an investment in a company called Fortigo, mm. which is aggregating truck truckers to deal yeah. with the brokers, mm. or ShopEx, which is aggregating small retailers. India is a market that is going from f informal to formal, mm. which means informal actors will have to get into the formal system, not by creating a massive company, but by aggregating around uh, aggregator. Mm. So I I think there's lots to be done. Your, your uh, colleague at Fundamentum, Sanjeev Agarwal, told me, he said, we're a great startup nation, but we're not a great scale-up nation. Why do you believe that's the case? Well, I think, you know, I've been dabbling in this startup world for the last two to three years. Before that, I never went anywhere in that. And I find that the startup world is now off, off to the races. There are lots of companies, lots of investors, angels, incubators, this, all that. So I think there's a huge pipeline of companies. Mm. But I think we need to see how to take these guys who have hit a particular maturity and then how do they build for the long term. Like mm. at Infosys, uh, you know, we, we always said how do we build a company for the future. So I think that kind of thinking. And so, so a large part of it is working with entrepreneurs who have a vision to create a durable, long-lasting company mm. and working with them. So help them on strategy, help them on finances, marketing, people development, leadership development. All boring stuff, mm. but that's the stuff which makes companies. You know, you, since you talked about Infosys, and I'm not asking you to comment on Infosys uh, today, but, you know, Mr. Murthy told us that uh, he regrets having left in 2014. In hindsight, do you believe that uh, perhaps if you had stayed on longer, uh, things would have been different? If he had stayed on. If you had stayed on longer. Well, I think, you know, uh, I mean, we can't say what, what, what happened, but I think, you know, the fact of the matter is that in 2009, uh, I was invited by Prime Minister Manmohan Singh to lead the Aadhaar project. I always had a passion for public service. And uh, my colleagues at Infosys were very gracious and gave me the permission to take that up. Mm. So I think uh, I started a new journey with Aadhaar. Mm. Then let me get, get you to comment on, on what Mr. Murthy said. He regrets leaving in 2014. Do you think things would have been very different if he had well, stayed Well, I think, on? you know, Murthy's always been very, very passionate about Infosys, and he has often said it's his third child. So I can see how he, how he feels, and uh, he's, he's very much involved. He's very much emotionally, involved. Emotionally, yeah. em Emotionally involved, okay. Uh, Nathan, what, what are you most excited about? As you, as you look at the landscape today, uh, you look at the various developments that have taken place, both at the level of the government as well as how corporations are now looking at the use of data, at democratizing uh, the digital culture. What makes you the most excited? No, I think we are seeing massive 
disruption due to technology. And every industry is now being changed in some way. Now, this is both going to create enormous opportunity and enormous threats, threats to incumbents and opportunity for newcomers, and also for those incumbents who have the ability to move quickly. So I think whenever there's this, this kind of activity, is always great fun to see the changing forces. Mm. And to me, that's what really gets me excited. Mm. So what, what would you predict would be the big changes that we'll see in India specifically over the next two or three years? No, I think we're going to go from being data poor to data rich. We're going to see new business models emerge that allow people to leverage their own data. You're going to have the democratization of credit, of health, of education, thanks to the reduction in knowledge asymmetry. And that is going to lead to economic growth and prosperity. And you're confident of that? And we have to make it happen. <laughs> OK. And, and what could be the one or two impediments that will, uh, that will perhaps uh, you know, get these plans not to fall well, into place? it's all in the execution, as, right? Yeah. I mean, it's all in the execution. So obviously, everybody should agree that this is what needs to be done. And then they have to do it. That's, that's all there is, agreeing what to do and doing it. You make it sound very simple. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Okay. Nanda Nilikani, always a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks very much for joining us here Thank on you. CNBC TV 18. With that, it is time for us to wrap up the CNBC TV 18 special. From all of us here, goodbye. Many thanks for watching.